Okay, this is the meeting of the Operations Committee on July 15th for Marin Municipal Water District. Um, could I have a roll call, please? Director Gibson? Here. And Chair Russell? Here. Wow. Just us cats. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I need a motion to adopt the agenda. Move approval of the agenda. Second. Roll second. call. <laughs> Director Gibson. I don't think you can. You can't second your own, Jack. Uh, I can't do it. Aye. <laughs> and Chair Russell. Aye. Okay. Public comment on any items not on the agenda. <clears throat> there are none. Okay. I need a motion to approve the minutes of the Operations Committee from the 20th of May and the 17th of June. Okay. So moved. Second. Roll call. Director Gibson. Aye. And Chair Russell. Aye. Okay. Number two, Courtright System Improvement Project. Hi, right, good morning, directors. Alex and I, engineering manager of the design section. I'll be presenting this item today. I got a, a brief PowerPoint presentation, which I'll share my screen real quick to get up. Are you seeing the presenter screen or the? We got you. We got you. Yeah. You can. It still but has your PowerPoint. slides on the side, but. Okay. Let's see. Start from beginning. Is that and better? Then, and then flip it. Display settings. Uh, and swap presenter. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay, so we're good to go. Okay, good. All right, so uh, good morning. I'm presenting the Court Right System Improvements Project uh, this morning. Uh, to start off, uh, currently the district operates uh, about uh, 131 uh, tanks in our system, six of them being redwood, eight concrete, and 117 being steel tanks. Um, the Court Right tank is a 50,000 gallon tank. Uh, that was constructed in 1973. Um, the image in the center kind of shows a picture of typical redwood tank construction, uh, which would have been done by redwood tank uh, construction back in that time. And the image on the right is uh, core right tank itself. And the tank provides services to 108 of our customers in the area. Uh, to date, the district has replaced 31 redwood tanks from our system in the past 10 years. And that leaves the, the district with six remaining redwood tanks to address, which staff is currently working on for replacement. Uh, Core right tank was originally scheduled for fiscal year 24, but staff did identify the need to replace it sooner because of its nature and, and leaking earlier. So staff began uh, designing the project uh, in January of this year. Um, so recently, staff have reduced the leaks on Core right tank by approximately 75% by plugging them and have addressed the uh, ponding issue around the tanks. And you can see in these images, there's uh, some gravel that was installed uh, to address that and things, uh, because of the reduction in the leaks, things are starting to dry out and, and things are no longer saturated in that area. Uh, so this is kind of a, a, a map of how the water gets to court right. So court right tank is right in this area right here. So water from the Ross Reservoir system flows down up to the Bret Hart pump station where it's pumped up to the higher elevation uh, Bret Hart tank. From there, gravity feeds down to Courtright and then from Courtright goes into the neighborhood uh, kind of shown by these red lines here. So that's how the water gets to Courtright tank and into the community. So earlier on in design, uh, the cystic hydraulic modeling showed that Courtright tank could be removed from the system by connecting the larger Bret Hart system uh, distribution main without affecting fire flow to the Courtright system. And, and that's gonna be done by the Bret Hart systems located right here, installing an eight inch main along this blue line of Bret Hart Road to the intersection at Brushwood, and then also divorcing the pipe from the court right feed at this location to continue the Bret Hart system, uh, at, which will allow us um, to uh, remove the tank from the system. By doing this, we'll also have to install a pressure regulator valve right at this location to remove the tank and the system piping from the area. So the project was advertised yesterday for construction and we're expecting to receive bids in two weeks. 
and bringing it back to the board on the 16th for award. If everything goes well, we should have the project completed by November 5th of this year. So the core right system project is estimated at $255,000 to install 520 feet of eight inch pipe, uh, the pressure regulator valve, which will allow us to remove the tank from the system and abandon the, the tank yard piping. And just for comparison, if we were to replace it, it would cost us around $700,000 to install a new 50,000 gallon welded tank, uh, along with a new concrete foundation, tank yard piping and drainage improvements around the area. So uh, the project benefit of doing the core right system improvements project is that we have an opportunity to combine two pressure zones into one, which will help simplify our distribution system. And in addition, by removing the tank and installing the pressure regulator valve, uh, we can eliminate the costs associated with maintenance and, and tank coatings in the future. So considering all this, you know, the staff recommendation is to review and refer the item to a future regularly scheduled board meeting for contract award. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Okay, I, I actually have a couple of questions. I, I will, a, a great idea and I'll move approval. Uh, but um, when we have started our uh, tank, red, uh, wood, Redwood tank removal system, I don't know how many years ago, but uh, was mainly driven by the risk of fire because the wooden tanks would literally burn up. Mm -hmm. um, and in each case, I think we're replacing it with a, a, a replacement tank other than Redwood. Uh, is this the only one that we've replaced? If you know off the top of your head, as we've gone through the process uh, with other than a, a new tank. Yeah, as far as removing and replacing with a regulator, this is the only one I'm aware of that we're doing that. Okay. Where we have that opportunity to do that. It doesn't, it, you can't always do that in every single location. It's just really based on a case by case basis. Yeah. So this is the first one that I'm aware of that we're actually removing from the system and replacing with a regulator. And it, it does align with um, the master plan work that we're doing and, you know, with a very defined strategy going forward of where we can reducing some of our in infrastructure that, as you know, is really disproportionate for our size agency, mainly due to the, the unique geography here, but also there's some legacy issues, right? These old systems we bought and really thinking about how to kind of right size things for, for future. Okay. Uh, also, I'm, I'm actually surprised we have any left. Uh, so when I, I see six remaining, I was a little startled. Um, the uh, uh, obviously, uh, every red, redwood tank doesn't present the same fire risk. I mean, the location and all of those things have to be factored in. I assume that is an analysis we've gone through in selecting which ones get replaced and when. The schedule, in other words. That, that is correct. We consider the risk, fire, uh, location, all, all those things are considered to evaluate how we can kind of schedule these replacements in the future. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Well, I've moved approval. So, uh, Alex, Alex. Oh, go ahead, Larry. I was just going to say, uh, what tank is going to be replacing uh, this tank as far as supplying the neighborhood? Uh, that that tank will be, or that neighborhood will be fed from the Bret Hart tank system. So, is that is that is that's a higher elevation tank? Uh, that is correct. It's a it's a larger volume tank a higher elevation. Uh, that's why we need to install the piping with a regulator to reduce the pressure into right. that system. Right, right, yeah. right, right. So, I mean, I guess at this point, it goes without saying you guys have kind of done that analysis on the other tank replacement projects. Correct. I mean, it just seems like a very elegant solution to the issue, so, you know. It, it, it presented the opportunity and it, and it works out perfectly. Yeah, 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 very, very well done. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Was this tank Alex built before the Bret Hart tank? Is that why it didn't happen then or? Uh, Bret Hart, don't have that, in, the, the construction date on Bret Hart off the top of my head, uh, but I, I, I could definitely look into that and get back to you. Uh, it's not that important. I'm just curious, you know, why they didn't do this when it was built originally, especially it's only 108 houses, huh? Yeah, correct. Mm. Okay. Um, well, we have a motion to refer it to the board. Any public comment? There are none. Okay. 
then let's move on. Thank you all. And it's number three. I believe that's me. That's the um, water shortage action levels. Um, I'm going to bring up my screen. Okay. Good morning, Board of Directors, Lucy Croy, Water Quality Manager. Um, this morning, we're going to go through um, a first discussion on water shortage action levels given the drought, um, drought response last year and, and lessons learned coming out of it. So today, um, uh, we'll go through a review of looking at the actions that were taken in 2021 and the opportunities that we see for improvement. Um, take a look back at the historical action levels that the district has had in place for, for quite some time. Um, and then take, a, take a, a review of the revised shortage action levels that um, we wanted to bring forth today and, and start the conversation with. So starting with um, first a, a look back at, la at last year and um, the last two years with the drought that we had going on. Um, the first uh, conservation, the first uh, drought action that was taken was in February 2021. Uh, Mid-February, we, we had a call for uh, voluntary conservation and that's when our storage levels were just around 45,000 acre feet. Um, and at that point, we were really hoping that we would have a a very um, a miracle march or, or lots of storms come through and we'd see our storage bounce up from there. Um, but from that point on, um, we, we didn't really see much, um, much more rain. Uh, and the, the rain going into that was also very dry. It was a very dry year. So um, without that spring rain, we moved into a water shortage emergency in April um, and adopted mandatory conservation, a call for 40% conservation, um, along with two days of, um, restricted to two days of irrigation. And then as we moved into July, um, we were we were restricted on um, how much supplemental supply we could take from Sonoma County, given that they were also experiencing dry conditions. So our, um, our take from Sonoma County decreased. And at that point, we, we moved to one day of irrigation. Um, and at that point, we also, put restrictions onto new connections. And then kind of at the tail end of the summer months, dry months going into September, October, um, ramped up even more, put water use restrictions and penalties in place in September um, to, to be effective start December. And then uh, put an ordinance in place for no winter irrigation. And so we wanted to bring this forth today to take a look at kind of the actions that we th that we took last year and if there's any improvements that we can make um, going forward to shorten this timeline. Um, many of the decisions and actions that were taken were, were during the summer months um, and much of our storage is known coming out of April. So April is a key, key date for the district. Um, typically we have about 80 89%, 90% of our rainfall received by at that point. Um, and as you can see, looking at April through October, those are months where we really know um, what the demand's gonna be more or less um, and what, what our storage levels will be come October. So um, stepping back water storage action levels, um, the intention is, is that they prompt actions, um, their thresholds that um, for our district, for our utility um, are focused on, on water supply, water storage conditions, and the intention is to preserve water supply. Um, a water storage contingency plan serves as a roadmap of action um, and how to proceed through those various levels of shortage and how you can conserve and save water. Um, with many unknowns coming up um, through the months, you don't know how much um, more rainfall you'll get. Um, so it, it provides a roadmap that can be followed or um, slightly deviated from um, given the direction of the board. So the district established triggers in the 1987-92 drought. Um, that's, that's when we see the first triggers that were really put on the books. Um, and that was after we faced five years of on again, off again, mandatory water use restrictions and messaging and, and the challenges that come along with that. So those triggers were first developed in that time range. And shown up here are 
um, the revisions of those of those um, water shortage levels that were developed at that point. So first developed in 1991 and then later refined in 99 um, based on the drought hydrology that was available. And so um, what those historical water shortage action levels are is um, a first stage, an alert stage, that's a voluntary call for voluntary conservation at, at, for 10%. Um, and that trigger is, is set at 50,000 acre feet on April 1st. Um, what we've seen historically is that um, it, it has been triggered, but um, in rare occasions. So in, in 1991, um, when these when these uh, storage these action levels were developed, it was triggered, and then also last year we would have fallen underneath that trigger as well. Um, the second trigger is a uh, mandatory conservation at twenty five percent, up to twenty five percent, and that's at forty thousand acre feet on April first. And looking back at our our historical record back to nineteen eighty four when uh, Kent Dam was raised. We, we really don't see that trigger actually being activated or hit. Um, so it's one of the reasons that we wanted to take a look at um, how to re best revise and, and maybe um, improve the triggers moving forward. And then lastly is the 50%, so the water shortage emergency trigger, which is uh, December 1st and it's been projected to be in the vicinity of, of uh, 30,000 acre feet or less. Um, this was triggered, we actually fell below 30,000 acre feet in 1991. Um, last year we were projecting to be below 30,000 acre feet and then of course we had the big rains in October and December so jumped above it. So taking a look at those triggers and, and how they would um, how they fall fall onto the, the um, storage levels that we had last year and the drought that we've experienced over the last couple of years um, starting with um, early 2020 and then through and through um, April 2021, we would have fallen under that 10% um, uh, con voluntary conservation uh, trigger, uh, 50,000 acre feet on April 1st, um, and, but we would have been above the 25%, so the 40,000 acre feet on April 1st for 25% mandatory. Um, and as I noted on the, one of the first slides, at that point in April 2021, we were actually moving into 40% conservation. So what we're seeing is, is that this 10% is, is not early enough um, for our storage levels and, and how quickly um, we, we go from being almost full to um, drop, dropping into very low levels if we have uh, one to two consecutively dry years. And then the third, as I noted, was um, 30,000 acre feet on December 1st. Um, and we were projecting to be below that, but of course jumped up from there. So now pivoting and, and starting to talk about how we can revise these water shortage action levels and, and beginning the discussion, a high level discussion. Um, what we've pulled together is looking at the historical um, reservoir shortages that we have now dating back to 1984 um, and also considering what we expect over the next um, coming decades with climate change, um, we've set up a proposed water shortage action levels that that are focused on April 1st, as I noted at the beginning, um, April 1st being a really key date for the district in which we know our storage level more and we know what it'll look like through the summer months. Um, and come October, that's really when we see a lot more variation in, in how our storage jumps up or stays low. Um, and also tied to that are the shortage response actions. Um, and today I wanted to present just a, a high level look at those. Um, the focus today is not necessarily on those response actions and getting into the details, but it's important to, to, to think about um, how they are tied to different shortage, shortage response um, triggers. So um, in the voluntary stage, it's really um, focused on our water use restrictions and maximizing our supplemental supply and outreach. And then as we move into mandatory, um, upping the response actions for landscape restrictions and, and new service applications potentially, um, all the way to over 50% moving into water allotments. Um, and, and that also comes into the case where we would have a, 
catastrophic interruption of water supply. These aren't built just for droughts, but also if we were to um, experience a, a different kind of emergency in which our supply was severely um, cut short. So stepping through these now more visually, um, starting first with the 10% that we've set up, um, the, the intention is that these are um, projected to be in the vicinity of 70,000 and 70,000 might sound uh, quite high to put at 10%, um, but surprisingly our storage is um, most of the time above this, uh, 70%, 70, 70, the 70th percentile is, is above um, 70,000 acre feet. So um, only in the years that we, we really see uh, the district moving into a drought, are we at the 70,000 mark or moving below it? And um, so the, the intention of the 10% is just to um, have an early indicator that, that we may be moving into the first year of a drought that could continue into a second year. Moving from there, we'd move into a 20% voluntary um, in the vicinity of 65,000 acre feet on April 1st. And, and still sounds quite high, but um, really has only been seen four, four times in the last 39 years. So um, it's, it's, it goes to show really how resilient our, our water supply has been, but the unknowns that um, moving forward, we, we see these as triggers that, that could be used um, using predictive natures. And, and if we see ourselves dropping below them, we would move into 20%. So 30% would be the switch over to mandatory um, in the vicinity of 55,000 acre feet on April 1st. 40% 40 at 45,000 acre feet on April 1st. 50% mandatory at, um, this should actually say 35,000 acre feet um, on April 1st and then um, greater greater than 50%. So going into that catastrophic situation where, you know, April 1st, once we, we really know how much rainfall we have received, we don't expect any over the summer months. Um, we typically see demand around 18 to 20,000 acre feet on our reservoirs over the next six months. Um, we would be moving into um, allotments or, or something very severe. So, Using these triggers and then thinking about how it would have um, applied to the applied to the drought that we experienced the last two years, um, April 1, 2020, so quite a bit earlier, would have been triggered uh, the 10 percent voluntary because we were in the vicinity of, of, of 70,000 acre feet. So starting that 10 percent voluntary conservation messaging um, in the community. Uh, nearly 10 months earlier than we started in February 2022, 2021. And then 40% um, we would have hit in April 2021. Um, and this is, of course, using the storage data we have available, um, not knowing, you know, if the 10% would have taken, where would our storage line, would it be higher? Um, but either way, um, the other note here is that um, we'd like to, to set these up to be flexibly um, approached so that, you know, going into October, November, December, if we're not receiving rain and then using the tools that we have available to us, like NOAA um, and, and understanding if it's a La Nina or an El Nino year, um, if the next three months we expect to be dry, um, we can call for that conservation earlier than April 1st. Um, there's so much variability in our storage uh, each year that it, it's hard to um, set a date at multiple times throughout the year. But um, once we're in the actual year and understand the weather conditions that we're experiencing, um, if there's a high pressure ridge off the, south of, the off of the coast of California that um, every atmospheric river is, is missing us, um, then we could flexibly call for that um, conservation, uh, a 20% conservation, say in January, um, projecting uh, that our storage would be below that threshold. So if I could, Lucy, yes. the, 
just to add to what Lucy's saying is th these would be um, triggers if we hit them or predict that we may hit them by April 1st. So we, we would enact the 10% back in the April 1st, 2020. And then likely by like November, we would be looking at this and saying, okay, let's do phase two because we haven't had any early rains. Mid-December, we would say, geez, you know, we haven't had the rains we typically do and we'd hit trigger three. So we wouldn't have jumped from stage one all the way then to stage four, right? 10% voluntary, 40% mandatory. Because um, in fact, part of what we're doing as part of the water supply assessment, we're gonna have a model that's gonna help with the predictive element with different considerations and this will be kind of an ongoing forward forward looking effort. So we'll be able to kind of move into this in a um, more anticipatory way than just having set triggers and trying to decide. Because really, of course, for us, it is all about April 1st, largely, because we don't expect typically to get much rain between that point in October, November. So April 1st is really the time where we've had a sense, you know, a, a very good sense of um, how that winter went. And unfortunately, but the reality is we know the next six or seven months are most likely dry. So April 1st really does give us the best time to look and predict and make the right calls as early as possible, which is and it, the data is somewhat surprising at 70,000 acre feet. But again, when we look at it, that's not a normal year. It suggests potential for a dry year. So we start that early communication to our customers. We track it and we're just staying on top in a looking forward basis. Uh, I have a, a question here also. Um, uh, I'm, all, I'm all for this kind of analysis, and so don't take any of this as as against it. Uh, I'm just a little, <clears throat> well, thinking out loud, I guess I have a question as to whether it's premature in the sense that we're basing it on 2021, which already with Costanza, we've increased the supply by, by the amount of a new Bon Tempe Reservoir. So the, the old model is, as of right now, not realistic. Uh, and then we're doing a full court press for you know, making the system even more secure with a number of alternatives we're looking at. Uh, so setting up a system where we're calling for or anticipating draconian decisions seems to me a little, you know, a little too early. Uh, it, it, that I'd say is, is a really, it's a fair point, uh, Director Gibson, you know, we do need to um, update our code um, consistent with the regulations. So we do have to develop these six triggers, adopt them and modify our code. Um, so really the question is, and the triggers are somewhat mandated 10, 20, you know, as um, Lucy mentioned. So then it gets to maybe the question is, um, and are you saying it feels like the 70,000 is too early to begin or, um, and, and that is an interesting point. And I would say, I believe Lucy, we have looked at, yes, our historical record does not account for the additional water um, that now we get from Castania. Um, I, I, I do think, in terms of our plans going forward, we do have X number of years where we do need to be able to manage water um, before um, you know, the roadmap is fully implemented. And absolutely, once a roadmap is implemented, I expect these triggers to significantly shift. And that's gonna be really a good place for us to be. But so I think if we think about it in the interim between where we are now and um, the implementation of the roadmap, how would we handle 
droughts or shortages um, to be um, to ensure we're ahead of the game, not premature and crying wolf. You know, and I it, that that's the balance. I, I do think with the comment, it we, we will go back, and this is just informational, and we'll continue. We have uh, plenty of time to work on it and think about okay, where we'd have had Castania. How would this have looked? And is 70 perhaps a touch? Um, you know, how would we think about it? I, I think what the answer may be is we wouldn't have hit it so early. It may be the right number because it indicates, but actually, Cassania brings in more supply. I, I think we'll have to bring that back. It, it is really a good point. Could, I think it's, a, I think, go ahead, Larry. Okay, sorry. Um, I kind of disagree with Jack's analysis because going forward, we're, we're going to have obviously Castanias online. So if we hit 70,000 acre feet, I would anticipate that's with winter water. So if we're at 70,000 with winter water, you know, that to me is showing a trend line of, you know, potential water shortage um, going forward. And just to repeat my point is, you know, I think we would have done a lot better if we had a little more time to get people to start conserving a little more robustly. So I'm all for the shift. Um, I think it's a good way to um, manage. I think the communications piece of it is probably the biggest challenge. Um, that I'm not uh, just for clarity. I, I'm not saying that the seventy thousand is a or a, any of these numbers are wrong numbers or the trigger is wrong. I'm just saying the analysis is premature, given the fact that we're uh, we're we're taking steps to change the the dynamic that we're measuring against in the future. Yeah, well, I, I think Director Bragman, if I just could very briefly, um, I think what we'll do is take a look at this and model it with Castania. And I think what we would find the slope of the line, you know, won't be as steep. Right. Right. Okay. Um, okay. And I, I, I just don't know without doing it, what it would really look like. Um, I don't know if the analysis would result with staff recommending to change the 70,000 acre feet number or just the timing um, it would give us more breathing room. We'd have to look at that, but I do want to recognize that the Castania was a big change, was a big improvement to our system. So I do think we'd benefit from looking at it. What would it look like with this significant enhancement? And Costanza isn't the end of the line. You know, I mean, we'll, God willing, be doing uh, more beyond that. Right. And, and to that end, uh, I think uh, both Jack and Larry are right on. But I think what's really missing here, Ben, is a completely different thing. Um, as Paul Sellier will definitely remember me harping about this in February of 21, um, the issue is I think we need a trigger on the purchase of additional uh, Sonoma River, uh, Sonoma water, so that we don't have to get into a discussion about whether we should drop the hammer or not. That should be included in this, that this is, these triggers are aimed at conservation, which is one approach. And this is basically what Jack is saying, but I think it's, it's a little more involved than that, that we need to pick up first the additional supply to make the decision, to help us make the decision in the future to start purchasing more water. Director that Rose. Oh. is kind of the icing on the cake of that. Yeah. I, absolutely. And I would say two things. One, um, really, with your prompting, you know, we did look at that and we have now really institutionalized the front loading purchases. So we maximize our within our ability starting July 1 to take Sonoma water, which then allows us halfway through the year to see what kind of winter we're getting and then bring to the board, okay, we think we can start decreasing, maybe we're full, you know, the mid-December, December, or slow down, or do we wanna to go to the full 
um, allotment we can. Um, so I do think with that front loading approach and um, you'll see Tuesday night, um, we're bringing a review of Sonoma and local storage and um, interties <clears throat> as a follow-up to the last water supply assessment. We'll be doing that uh, at the board meeting. And um, the kind of, of Sonoma, the number one kind of low hanging fruit is you just need to maximize Sonoma water um, and just what you're saying. And that's identified as an approach going forward. And I just think that uh, we'll certainly be going in that direction. It, it does certainly have a budgetary impact like everything, but um, regardless, you, you look at cost effectiveness and all that, um, it, it, all indications are that's the way we, we need to go. And um, that's gonna make a, a notable difference in our um, uh, supplies. Yeah, and as we discussed, Ben, you know, we you haven't had the thrill of watching your eleven hundred dollar an acre foot water go over the spillway, <laughs> but it's coming. Okay, uh, Krishna got to enjoy that yeah. Um, yeah. event, and it's just one of those things. You know, you just have to put on your big boy pants and say, "Well, we'll catch it next year." You know, um, and of course, what that does is after you see a few million dollars worth of water go over the spillway, then you um, get gun shy. The next year. That's why I think formalizing these into some kind of a uh, action uh, thing, which can always be overridden, but hopefully um, we see it as a long-term uh, issue and we start, you know, the ball rolling early. The other thing, of course, is we need to integrate the 218 efforts with this precisely so that when this happens, something else happens. So. Yeah, and then I also noticed just one other variable on supply is uh, the uh, habitat um, spills. I noticed, I think Sonoma's already filed for, for the uh, TUCP petition for this year. They have, yeah. And so- And, and, and that went in effect um, July 1, um, which also, as we've mentioned, and we'll continue to talk about, um, comes with a curtailment. Um, from Sonoma. So we'll be getting into that as well. But um, up to July 1, and as we reported to the board with really great efforts from operations, we we're able to, right, it was record breaking this past fiscal year in how much water we were able to take from Sonoma. Um, starting July 1, we're curtailed. Lucy or Paul, do, do you know what the curtailment is like? Three MGD is, is that? Do you know? 3.8, I believe. Yeah. So what we're curtailed to 3.8 MGD um, until that gets lifted or we get some early rains and are able to do last year, similar to last year where we're pulling winter water that is not subject to the curtailment. The curtailment is the water coming from Lake Sonoma. Yeah, well, my, my point too was we may need a third trigger on filing a TUCP right. here in Lagunitas Creek. So, that's, you know, that, I know- that's, that's a great point. And what we aren't getting into detail today, in detail, all the actions that come with these triggers, what we're just showing kind of the big ones and kind of how this would look, but each one of these triggers, and do, do we have Lucy where we bring up a TUCP, which stage? Uh, no, we don't have it on this table yet. Um, I think it's probably a discussion point going forward. Um, yeah. This is what we've pulled together so far. Um, yeah. Well, I know, you know, one of the, one of the uh, objections that's going to be filed, you know, regularly, if we do have to file a TUCP is, you know, we, we're going to need to demonstrate uh, conservation among our, among our customers. Right. So it's a, it's definitely going to be um, kind of a, a blended approach. So I, I, yeah, I don't think it's one or the other. And uh, it's just, you know, it's a big reduction of supply that I think we need to keep on the table, unfortunately. You know, maybe that helps reinforce the conservation message. I hope that people understand that, how they're interconnected. 
when the state is evaluating those, uh, Sonoma has requested one already. And, and, and if we did it simultaneously, is the approval, likelihood of approval impacted uh, on either if we both are applying or are they, if anybody knows the answer to that, or does the state evaluate those in an isolated sense, Sonoma's and ours? I can speak to that. I mean, there there may be some um, consideration of the impact that we're, we're experiencing due to the fact of the curtailment from the north, right. but there's also going to be um, really an evaluation of our own circumstances, um, of our own water supply and and you know options. So I would say it's a piece, um, and so it's not it's not going to be um, decisive in any in either direction, in my opinion. Yeah, and, and right now is a good example of, it, it's really very delinked. Um, Lake Sonoma did not get the rainfall um, that we did. So the, they're um, today in um, a worse position in terms of uh, their storage than we are. So, um, you know, it, as we think about this, you know, would it be stage three or four? And it's really a, a very good discussion point when we bring this back of where that would be, but um, there's really no projections that would get us to that point, uh, pending how the next uh, winter looks. Well, I'm not so sure about that, Ben. It seems to me that we could have a fork in the decision-making process at July 1st, with curtailment, without curtailment. You'd have two different um, scenarios. I presume, uh, Lucy, the 3.8, is some calculated number or is it a consequence of some arbitrary conservation number? Is it proportion to the other users or is it just, we wanna conserve 10% and you get whacked to this level? Oh, I, I can answer that. It, it, it's a little more complicated, but it, it is calculated. It's a, an allotment um, that's sort of prescribed and has a lot of different factors associated with it. One of which is a, a sort of local storage levels so it takes okay. into account local supplies um, it, it's, I have a, paul right it's to me um a system-wide for yeah, sonoma 20 yeah. percent reduction but yeah there's a whole calculation process to get there that includes what alternative supplies do you have and because we happen to be in a good storage situation, we got cut a bit further than we did last time. I think Paul's done a great job kind of helping to manage that and ensure that we're treated, you know, appropriate fairly as everyone else. And I, I think we feel we are. Uh, I have a question. It's probably not a very likely scenario, but what would happen to our contract if we got stuck with 3.8 for the whole year? What if they decided that was all we could have? Does that, is that addressed in the contract? Our, our minimum take is 5.4, as I recall. Yes, yeah, it's, it's 5.3 thousand. Um, it, it's a good question and it's crossed my mind. I just assume that since we're being required to take that reduced amount that we would expect relief from that minimum take or pay. That would certainly okay. be the position we would want to take under those circumstances. Yeah, but I'm not sure that's specifically stated. And it's probably not very likely because uh, it, going forward, if we're looking for more water from Sonoma to balance our needs, uh, we're not going to be very pleased if we're restricted below our minimum. Right. 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 But, right. You know, now, yeah. well, with the understanding, and just to reinforce, and you understand that, but also for the public listening, that um, the restrictions as occurred last year and we expect going forward are related to releases from Lake Sonoma. And what we call winter water is a free flowing water coming down the Russian River and largely going out to the ocean. So tapping that water, which we can't do now because it's not there, it hasn't rained in some time, but uh, tapping it as we did last round last year um, was outside of the curtailment in all indications. And as we go into looking, for example, at the Sonoma option, 
as part of the water supply assessment, we'll be firming up with clarity that assumption going forward um, in terms of all of the uh, winter water alternatives we'll be looking at on Tuesday. Of course, and keep in mind, ask, Ben, as I've talked about the, the um, rainy collectors, I, I don't really think that the flow in the river has much to do with the rainy collector potential capability. I mean, it's fine to talk about it that way, but I don't think it's really accurate in the sense of how the hydrogeology of the rainy collectors works. I think that water is there for the taking all the time, because as we've, you know, I've indicated previously and I've discussed this with Jay and others, that there is no stage drop, at no, no river level decrease at the rainy collectors, indicating to me that there's no demand, no net negative intake to the rainies from the surface water. Right. And as I've discussed, you know, I think we just need to look at the temperatures of the two and we'll see that that's indeed for sure the case. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I do think there's some also maybe dry creek issues that come into play in terms of if they're reducing their environmental releases, um, they want to see, the state wants to see conservation similar to kind of us, uh, Brag, Doc, Director Bragman. Yeah, absolutely. I ask a, a question, and this goes to um, President Russell's comment about the rainy collectors. Are those downstream of Lake Sonoma? Yeah. Okay. All right. So it actually is a river flow water. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, so sort what, of. What 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 was uh, Larry? What was your point that there's like an that there's an aquifer that that's that's actually every every river has two rivers the one you see and the one you don't see. So there's a second flow under the river, uh -huh. a, a moving aquifer. Right. And when, if you were, if, if you saw a decrease in the water surface when the water passed the rainies, that would say that the rainies are sucking surface water in. Right. But they don't see that. That was the first, first question I asked Sonoma Water 20 years ago. I said, is there a stage drop, a level drop across the rainies? And the answer was no. And the second part of it is that the, from experience I have for the state of California and the Sacramento River, uh, we were hired to help them get more flow into the rainy collectors for their central cooling system. And when I got hired, they were out there scarifying the bottom of the Sacramento River, at which point I said, well, you know, look at the temperatures, guys. The temperature in the river is 10 degrees warmer than the temperature in the water you're collecting in the rainy collectors. Well, there's no way for the water to cool going from the surface to the rainy collectors. So the only way for that to happen is that there's the flow is in the, the underground aquifer, meaning that scarifying the bottom is a waste of time yeah, because yeah. the water's not coming from the top. It's coming from the sides. So that was the point. And, and I believe that's exactly the situation we have here, meaning that, you know, the stage condition, the level condition in the river is kind of irrelevant to what's happening. In maybe the the broadest hydrology, there's an impact, but in the in the actual rainy collector operation, I don't think the surface water level has much to do with the rainies. And and one other question, uh, I don't want to prolong it, but are, is Sonoma collecting water from downstream for their own use as well, or are they just using uh, Lake Sonoma, Lake Mendocino? No, so th they do um, when winter water's available, um, which is right, you know, most of the winter and spring, uh, the water they're pulling from the rainy co collectors, they, they probably do have some minimum stream releases for Dry Creek that do get into the Russian River, um, but generally they're pulling what we would call winter water as well. Okay. Is that fair? It uh, Paul, based yeah. on you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Everybody's, all the supplier, all the partners, users draw from the rainy collectors. Everybody. Okay. Okay. So okay. Thanks it so is much. the source of water. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good to know. It, it's a convenient way to get around the need for, for filtration. So uh, in the simple mind of this way, this is called bank filtration, but it's really not bank filtration because like I say, it's not really pulling from the surface water. But the idea is you don't have to treat the water 
it's drinkable under state rules when you yeah, pull yeah, it yeah. from the rainy collector. That's the beauty of the rainies. Yeah, isn't that what the, the French developed that years ago when the Seine got too polluted, they started doing the, the side collection kind of thing. Yep, yep, exactly. Okay, uh, public comment. Um, yes, earlier I saw Ed Jamison and then Roger Roberts. Go ahead, Mr. Jamison. Can you hear me? Yes. Loud and clear. Thank you. I just wanted to comment that this has been a really outstanding discussion by all the participants today. And I wanna say thank you for, for this, uh, this session and the, the competence, particularly of the staff to present this so well. It gives a sense of confidence to me sitting here as a user. Uh, I just wanted to express that. Thanks. So thanks. Thank, Thank you, Andy. Mr. Roberts. Uh, you can hear me, I trust. Yes. Loud and clear. How do you square uh, this planning for triggers with water resources board at the state level mandates? And how will you adjust your actions accordingly. Thank you. Paul, do you want to? <laughs> That's a hot potato. <laughs> well, it's an interesting question and I'm not sure that it's fully defined. So I think Mr. Roberts has dropped off. I'd like him maybe to. Well, I, I, I thought what, what I was teeing up is my understanding is that we're meeting um, where the state is and going in terms of mandates today. And then the triggers that we've developed, this 10, 20, 30, is precisely what the state is asking that we all have these triggers. And there's some element of flexibility in it. And then the state also requires now annually looking at a forecast in terms of um, the upcoming year, your state of supply. So I, I would say that this really meets and exceeds um, where most folks are today, but also going forward with what we understand to be the direction the state's going generally. And that could change certainly as things get tougher for the big, you know, state water projects, because um, all indications are they're going to apply kind of a one size fits all. And there's a lot of discussion of that and how to do that. But what we are working and keeping an eye on what's coming out of the state. And I think this uh, aligns with that. And I think as Donald Rumsfeld said, you don't know what you don't know. You, know, <laughs> you, you, you gotta just get there. I mean, you know, the answer Roger is we'll adapt as we go. I mean, who knows where the state's headed, huh? Um, and, and I think uh, Ben is exactly right. They've been using a one size fits all approach, which is a little tricky for us. Fortunately, we're below, I, I think we're one of the few, if only water districts that's made the state's request on conservation. And um, I think we need to continue to pat our users on their back for helping us to be in compliance with those requirements. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I haven't, I haven't really looked at the decision from the state board on our TUCP uh, petition, which was granted, but that would definitely give us a little, I think, some help about how to implement the trigger for, for that process. Mm -hmm. That's a good so point. Worth, worth taking a look at that again. So um, yeah. can I ask the, the committee, um, so we've had some feedback, do you think, and again, I, I think staff, and I'm sure you'd agree, we'd like to get this in place, you know, let's say by October timeframe, which is the coming wet season. Based on this presentation, do you think we need another informational discussion item or um, should, you know, and of course during that we would um, do what we noted in terms of Director Gibson's thought of integrating Castania into what that projection would look like and if others would change. So anyway, we're, we're good either way. We could bring it back to a, another committee or bring it back for um, potential adoption by the board. Me, I, I'd prefer to get it back one more time before adoption <laughs> and see if 
we get Castania yeah. integrated and and maybe as far as the remedy with the TUCP, you know, how how that plays <clears throat> or how that fits in. So that would be my preference. Just yeah. we have to, time. So it, yeah, it's, that's the question. If there's no time sensitivity to it, right. why not? Good. Okay, and it, the other two board members that weren't able to make it would benefit probably as well. Yeah, 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 that too. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, the other thing, don't forget the um, curtailment needs to be ground in there too. Yes, yes. So that, you know, like I say, like I say, I think that can be handled with a fork. The, if it has, if it happens, if it doesn't happen, it pushes one way or the other. Right. Um, but yeah, I think that's a great idea. Okay. Okay. Um, hearing no other comments, let's adjourn. All right. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. Have a good Thank week, everybody. See ya. You good too. Everybody. Bye.